All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation. We got a special edition of Knicks Fan TV presented by KnicksFanTV.com. We are just about at the midway point with these Knicks. And look, the season has been filled with some bright spots and certainly some low spots as well. So I wanted to touch on some of the key storylines of where we are right now with the Knicks with Fred Katz, man. He does a great job of covering the Knicks for The Athletic. Fred, how you doing today, man? Thanks for joining us. I'm great. I'm I'm better than my my microphone, which I dropped on its head. <laughs> you have you have the superior setup to me to me today. So, uh, but I hope I can at least bring some 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 solid and entertaining analysis to your show. Hey, listen, man. On, on this show, you know sometimes these things happen. Whether it's technical difficulties <laughs> or you you have no mic, no, it it happens, man. So uh, we always try to make the best of it here. But nevertheless, th- thanks for joining us. On these Knicks, man, we, we got to start it off with, with Julius Randle. He's been the talk of the town, averaged 28 points, 11 rebounds, four assists in the month of December. You have, um, you know, shooting his, his best effective field goal percentage since he's been on the Knicks. Mid-range, 44%. A career low in turnover percentage. Um, just, just all across the board, Julius Randle is playing outstanding basketball. And to me, that was going to be one of the keys to a successful season for this team was obviously going to be how can Julius, will Julius be able to turn it around after an abysmal season last year? I believe he was like third in his position in effective field goal percentage last year. Now that's up to 60th percentile. What have you seen between last year and this year uh, is the key difference in Julius Randle? Well, he came into the year offensively, I think, really embracing this new role that he's in, right? I mean, they they bring in Jalen Brunson, and he's just playing off the ball more. His shot selection has changed. I think the shot selection stuff is independent of Jalen Brunson. Uh, you know, I, I he he's and he's good. He's certainly better to start the year than he was last year, but he wasn't playing like he did in December and, and like he is right now. It's reached a new level. And if you look at the last few weeks, he actually is, you know, the start of the year, it was like no long range dues and, and just try to get to the rim and all of that. And if you look at the last few weeks, it's almost like he's found like a nice little middle ground. I think sometimes when you look at players, they have to go to their extremes to test their limits. And then they find a middle ground. That's, that's good and comfortable for them. You know what I mean? Like, like Jeremy Grant is a good example of that, where, mm-hmm. where Jeremy Grant was in Denver. He was a role player. Uh, he was really kind of catch and shoot on the outside. Every once in a while, he put it on the ground. But he was a he was a fourth, fifth option inside their their best lineups and wasn't as much. And then he decides he wants to be a first option. He goes to Detroit, and he is scoring like crazy, but he's not doing it efficiently, and the team isn't winning, and he's not playing winning basketball. And now he's in Portland. He's found a nice middle ground, right? Where he's got a much bigger role than he did in Denver, but he's still with Dame and he's with Anthony Simons and it's a different sort of situation. So what does that have to do with Julius Randle? You might rightfully ask. Mm. Uh, I think Randle kind of in a similar way had to go to the extremes of like, I'm never shooting long twos. I'm only shooting threes and at the rim. And now we see him taking more acceptable long twos yeah. than he did. You know, like, He's not dribbling around for 14 seconds and shooting a fadeaway for the most part. These are balanced standstill mid-range shots. I think that's why you see the mid-range percentages better. I mean, you mentioned 44 from mid-range. Last year, he was in the low 30s. He was one of the worst, uh, you know, high-volume mid-range shooters in the NBA. That's a a really unacceptable number. This year, he's at a really good one again. You know, the the types of shots can change, even if the locations are, are somewhat similar. I think we're just seeing him as a quicker decision maker, a better decision maker. And look, more shots are going in. Like he's taking more threes and he's shooting shooting a higher percentage of them. Looks good when the shots go in. Uh, but I think it's kind of a mix of all of that that we're seeing from Randall, sort of him testing his extremes and then realizing, okay, this is the sort of analytically friendly stuff that's going to work the best for me. Yeah. And he is correct. It's working. Yeah, he just seems to be in in a comfort zone and a groove right now that we haven't seen since that All-Star year in 2020-2021 in which a lot of people attributed to no fans in the stands 
right now you really can't make that argument man because the places are packed the knicks are, are one of five teams with, with a above 500 road record he's a big part of that uh top of the league in terms of first quarter scoring so he just seems to be just just in this groove offensively man where he's just taking what the defensive is giving him if he's on a smaller matchup which in a lot of nights he is you know, when, when you look at the size and the physicality that he brings to the game, a lot of teams, when they're bringing single coverage at him, it's a smaller, it's, a lot of times it's a, it's a smaller player, and he's picking his poison, whether he wants to attack the basket, he's getting a lot, he's drawing a lot of fouls on those rip-throughs, so he's doing a good job of really just taking what the defense is giving him and, and using it to his advantage. Yeah, that's another part of it, too. That's a good point, the rip-throughs, man. Like, he's always had that move but he's going to it like crazy yeah. now, right? Yeah. Where he, he, this is an era where a lot of guys who are good at rip throughs are still good at them, but they're not good at getting them into shooting. Fouls. Right. Right. Julius, you know, for example, Chris Paul is famous for using a rip through, yeah. right? But now with the way that referees have started calling it in the last five years or so, if Chris Paul goes for a rip through into a shot, they're going to call it side out. That's right. It's not a shooting foul. It's, it's on the floor. And, and it's great to use in the bonus, and it's great to use when you have a great defender on you or something. They get a hand in, you want to get an extra foul on them. But it's it's not as good as when you can get into a shooting foul. And there's something with Julius. I, I think it's that his his shooting motion is so quirky. Like, they, they see that he will shoot in those sorts of weird, like his legs bent when he's midway in the air and his, his torso's to the side. They'll shoot at these weird strange angles that like they can't be like it's not a shot because he probably would have shot it like that uh and 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 if if you're gonna get those fouls if it's really gonna work like it has i think he has really good recognition of when somebody has a hand in the cookie jar too like, yeah that's part of it like if you put a hand into you know above his above his hand like he is going to hit it and you are going to get called for a foul. That's just how he's operating now. And again, it comes back to that's just quick reactions, right? That's yeah. quick decision making. That's noticing this guy's got his hand where it's not supposed to. I'm going up. And and there are a lot of guys in the league who are who are awesome at that. Uh, obviously, James Harden. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Chris Paul. DeMar DeRozan is amazing at that. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of guys in the league who are excellent at that and i think julius randall is is one of them at drawing that specific kind of foul especially because he just turns him into shooting fouls now you got to give him credit for that man the free throw attempts are up as well and his shooting foul draw rate and non-shooting foul draw rate are, are up as well and you can see it on the court so he's just doing a great job and uh and really just exposing uh, defenses and, and being a smarter player so that that's definitely well deserved on but on his part but um he gives a lot of credit to jalen brunson for his improvement this year and just overall when you when you look at the starting lineup obviously the, the, the Brunson impact is noticeable what Quentin Grimes is bringing to this team RJ Barrett is certainly before pre finger injury was was taking another step up this is I mean yes this team is only hovering around the the eight spot but this is right now to me in terms of complementary pieces the best group that he's played with when you look at Quickly's maturation coming off of the bench, what the offense is bringing, Mitchell Robinson's maturation as well, I think as a whole, the team is is allowing him to be a better player as well. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, definitely, definitely the Brunson stuff. You're right. He is he is very complimentary of Jalen Brunson, and I think he's right too. I mean, you know, for example, you talk about his turnover rate being down. Well, it's because he doesn't have to initiate as yeah, much. Yeah. Like his, it's not just that people talk about, well, you have a good point guard and all of a sudden your shots are easy. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely true, but it's not the whole story. It's actually that you have a good point guard and your touches are easier. Right. Like he has a good point guard who sets him up in a good situation, not just to shoot. Cause the point of basketball isn't just create something and then pass it out. And then that person you pass it to takes a shot. Mm -hmm. It's you create something, you pass it to somebody, and that person you pass it to makes a decision. Mm -hmm. They cut or they go into another action or they shoot or they pass or whatever. 
And it is easier to make that decision right now because of the way Jalen Brunson sets everybody up. I mean, look at how the offense played in those games that Brunson wasn't there. Yeah. Yeah, they they scored some points. Like, they scored some points against Houston. Mm -hmm. It was Houston, but they (laughs) scored some points against Houston. But just look at the offensive process. I mean, it was quickly, and it was Randall taking all of the shots. Yeah. And Randall played well because he's just playing incredible basketball right mm-hmm. now. He played well. I don't think he needs Jalen Brunson to play well at this point. But for the team to play well, I mean, Jalen Brunson just makes everybody's job so much easier. He's he's just so competent in terms of the way that he organizes everything. And I think that has a profound effect on Julius Randall and just about everybody else, to be honest. No question about it. And we're talking to Fred Katz, who covers the, covers the Knicks for The Athletic. And on the on the Randall front, his mental approach to the game, w- what have you seen? You know, last year was a tough year for him. He had the thumbs-down incident with the fans. I remember there was a game prior to the thumbs-down incident, I, I believe it was against the Pacers, where I think he either got an and one, he fell on the floor, and then he was jawing at somebody in the crowd. It just seemed like there, there was just a lot of... Uh, distractions for him. the and vibes were bad the vibes were bad it was they were bad yeah it. but yeah. this year it, it, it just seems like he, he's in a better place mentally yeah for sure for sure i mean look i i've had conversations with nba players before mm. who have warned me whenever a guy is playing weirdly uncharacteristically for a long time stop looking at the basketball mm. just don't Stop Stop looking at what's wrong with his jump shot. Stop looking at what's he doing with his footwork. Just is probably something that has nothing to do with basketball. Uh, and, yeah, the vibes were just weird last year. I mean, there was there was the the fine, which technically went to the team, where he didn't, mm-hmm. he didn't talk to the media for seven consecutive games mm-hmm. uh, after. Uh, there was, yeah, there was the thumbs down incident. There was... And it was just weird behind the scenes vibes too. Like they just weren't very good. And and this year, I think he's come in with a very, just a, a completely different attitude. Mm. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting seeing how he performed last year. I wouldn't have guessed that he was going to so willingly take a role change, right? Mm-hmm. Like the question when Kemba came in, Right. Part of the reason they brought in Kemba and Evan Fournier was to take some of the ball handling burden off of Julius Randle. Now, it didn't work, Mm -hmm. but those were the intentions, right? Yeah. And maybe it was because Randle just recognized these guys aren't as good as me, and so they're not going to take the ball handling burden off of me. And it's not technically wrong if that was what his thought process was. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he didn't necessarily – relinquish any of those duties that we're talking about you know their crunch time offense was still kind of run a pick and roll for julius Mm -hmm. he's gonna go to the nail and then he's gonna post a guy up face a guy up and Mm -hmm. take a bad shot and and that's gonna be it i didn't necessarily expect him to so willingly he's not taking a back seat but just so willingly change his role uh in terms of more catch and shoot stuff, more mm-hmm. threes, less mid range, less off the dribble. Uh, when you touch the ball, you're not going to touch it for as long. Quicker right. decisions, all that stuff. Uh, running the floor more, um, and and you know what? Over these last fifteen ish games, playing much harder defensively. Yeah, I just I didn't see all of those things changing so enthusiastically uh, and so willingly. It's like there was no resistance on his part, and. That stuff helps it, when you play looser, when you when you welcome the change, good things are, are can happen. And right now he is showing that. I mean, he's for sure. I don't know if he's going to make the all star team, but he's definitely one of the people you have to mention when you talk about, you know, possible Eastern Conference all stars. It's a tough one, man, because as you mentioned, all star, I kind of wrote down that the guys who I think are locks. Right. Obviously, it's the Greek freak uh, Embiid. I've got Katie, Donovan Mitchell, Siakam, Tatum, and Brown. I got to put Kyrie in there. I think Kyrie is, is definitely deserving. Um, yeah, I think I agree. On with the you. court, you know, Halliburton. I've got Halliburton yeah. there. Now, not that, a fake All Star. Not a fake All Star. <laughs> so I've got, 
I've got 10 so far, right? I've got nine so far, rather. And 12 make the team. You want to put DeRozan in there? Beal, you got to talk about Bam as well. Heat, Heat is certainly surging after a slow start. It's going to be tough, man, but I think Randall deserves to be in there. If you're going to put him in that in that borderline with, with DeMar and Beal, I got to give him the edge for how his team is played and how he's impacting those wins. I, I, I think it's tough, man, but I still got to give him the edge and get him in there. Yeah, and did, did you say Donovan Mitchell? Yes, also? I did, yeah. Or did yeah. I? Yeah, I, t- okay. I said Mitchell, yeah. yeah. So I was going to say, he, he's getting in there. I mean, <laughs> yeah, there are some other guys, too. I mean, Jimmy J- Jimmy Butler yeah. has an argument. Uh, I think James Harden has an argument. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, obviously, he's not the player that he used to be, but the, the dude is still, like, a really good point guard. He yeah. has absolutely massive games. I think Darius Garland has an argument. Mm-hmm. I think Drew Holiday has an argument. There are a lot of a lot of guys who have a chance of getting in. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, Beal with Washington. Yeah, I think there is a case to be made for a former Nick who happens to play for the <laughs> Washington <laughs> Wizards. <laughs> well, you put you put Porzingis in great there with Julius. Porzingis is having a good year, man. I hate to admit it, but he's having a good year. I, the the only reason that I would argue for Porzingis over. Julius is just to see the reaction on this podcast. <laughs> if that were to happen, that would, emergency that would be the podcast one reason I would advocate across the Knicks exactly. sphere, emergency podcast I, everywhere. I, I think seeing Nick's Twitter just <laughs> react to that would, would be worth it. Even if it's not technically the right basketball decision. No, uh, unfortunately I have, I have a little, a little bit too much journalistic integrity to <laughs> let that determine my vote if I get one, but, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind it. It would be yeah. unbelievably funny. Uh, I would say Julius has a really good argument over Beal. The thing that Julius has going for him with all-star mm. is quantity. Uh, he has played what the third or fourth most minutes in the NBA right, right. now. Mm-hmm. You know, a guy like Beal has been hurt. Uh, James Harden has missed some time. Like it's quantity matters. People mm-hmm. crap on quantity. Guess what? It matters. More of a good thing is a better thing. Yeah, right, right. It's, that's how it works. These aren't these aren't cookies. It's not like once you, once you eat two of them, you're like, oh no, I got to start really worrying about the calories right. now. No, more more of a good thing is a better thing. Mm-hmm. If I told you you can make a hundred thousand dollars a year or a million dollars a year, you wouldn't be like, oh no, I don't want the quantity. Yeah, right, right. I don't want the quantity. You'll you'll take the million. More mm-hmm. of a good thing is a better thing. And Julius Randle doing having really 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 good production over a lot of time where he's been available in a in a league by the way when no one is consistently available in. right i mean he's played in every game right uh it's it's impressive by the way jalen brunson is in the conversation sure. too i think there is an argument for brunson over julius randall for the exact reason that we just discussed mm-hmm. where like part of randall's credit the product the credit for randall's production part of it has to go to brunson yeah like brunson is the guy who makes everything in that offense tick Mm -hmm. and and randall for you know how good he's been lately the first 15 18 games whatever it was defensively he was you know really one of their biggest defensive culprits during that slow defensive start that they got off to and it's changed since and i don't think that it all disqualifies him but it should be part of the conversation for sure but yeah he's been Mm -hmm. He's been really, really good. I don't know if he gets in. Like, he's averaging, you know, what, 20, 23 a game or yeah. whatever. Uh, and that's, like, 20th in the NBA. He's, like, 10th or 9th or 11th, whatever it is, in the Eastern Conference in scoring. You know, we, we're conditioned to see 23 points a game. We're like, damn, that's really good. Right. And now it's like, yeah, it's really good, but we, we have to remove the damn. Because yeah. everyone is scoring like crazy everyone this year. Everyone is scoring like crazy, man. <laughs> I, I think the stat is there's uh, 88 players have scored 40 plus this year already, and the, I believe the record is uh, That's is 142 back in 1961. Yeah, I was looking at it yesterday afternoon. Yeah, and 50, 54 players in the league are averaging 
20 points a game. Yeah. 54. Crazy. That used to be like, oh, you're averaging 20. You're right in the conversation for this. And yeah. now it's like they could double the size of the all-star team and still not get yeah. every player still averaging have 20 into the all-star game. S- still have yeah. snubs, man. It- it's incredible. The 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 offensive talent that, that we have in this league. Uh, we're talking to Fred Katz, who covers the Knicks for the athletic. You know, Fred, you, you talked about the Knicks defense just a little while ago and – we got to talk about the anchor of this defense, a guy who Julius Randle gives a lot of credit to, and that is Mitchell Robinson. When you talk about durability, he's only missed eight games. Um, third overall in offensive rebounding percentage. Second overall. Fifth in blocks. I mean, from his pick and roll coverage, his tenacity at the rim, his rebounding, you know, Mitchell Robinson is so important for this team. And his durability has been important as well. And another another area I got to give him credit for is his discipline, especially when it comes to fouling. I mean, October, November, he was averaging about 3.2 personal fouls. December, he's down to 2.6. A disciplined Mitchell Robinson, man. I'm loving what he's bringing to this team right now. Yeah, the fouling is a good point. He was over fouling a lot at the beginning of the year, yeah. getting into foul trouble. He's a huge reason why the defense has changed. He's a huge reason why the defensive rebounding has changed. Uh, Yeah, I agree. I think he's better than ever. I really do. Uh, People think of him as a rim protector. But the pick and roll defense has been really good. One thing that he's so good at is using his length to – he's so long that he's actually able to use one hand – to kind of deter a driving lane. Mm-hmm. Like when they'll they'll say they'll they'll use drop coverage or something in a pick and roll. And the guy will come around a screen, he'll kind of have a leg up on his defender. And now Mitch has one big man rolling to the rim and one guy with the ball going downhill. Mitch will have one hand basically deterring a driving lane and another hand deterring a passing lane. Yeah. Cause he just takes up the whole court because he's so long. And that's where the discipline comes in. Mm-hmm. I think young Mitch would try to block shots All in those everything. situations. Yeah. Yep. Leave his feet. Leave his feet. I have uh I have I have a good buddy who somehow in NBA 2K when we would play as kids became amazing. He would just pump fake all of us. And that was all <laughs> he tried to do, it became a shtick. And once he got us to pump fake and and got us in the air. He would say, lose your feet, lose the game every <laughs> single time. And it just became a bit. Yeah, yeah. It was just lose your feet, lose the game. <laughs> it's a pretty good chance he's going to listen to this podcast. Yeah. But I, you know, Mitch would lose his feet and lose the game yeah. all the time. And we just don't really see it. The discipline is so much better. That's part of the reason why the fouls, that you, as you mentioned, are down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he is using his length and his athleticism for a lot of good. I think he's found a nice middle ground on uh, being bulky, but not too bulky as well, where he's able to be really strong at the rim now. Uh, but but I think last year he came in and he admits this. He came in. He came in too bulky, too big. not necessarily like in bad shape, mm-hmm. but just not in the type of shape that he needed to be in, you know, like he's so springy and athletic and when you put on too much muscle, you lose some of that. And, and it, it, I think definitely affected his effectiveness uh, coming into the start of last year. So I I think he's been way better. And and meanwhile, like, I don't know, I was talking to somebody in the league who works for another team recently. And he told me that they were having a meeting and they were talking about how uh, they think Mitchell Robinson is the best offensive rebounder since Dennis Rodman. Mm. Wow. Uh, there are times when I don't know if I agree with that take, but it kind of blew my mind to yeah. hear a smart NBA person say that, that a team internally was just kind of, they were just kind of casually having that conversation in the office. Yeah. Uh, it, see how crazy Mitch has risen as an offensive rebounder. I mean, there are times where the Knicks offense is struggling and their best chance to score is with yeah. a missed shot. Yeah. And it's it is wild to see him be so relentless and get a hand on everything. And it's exhausting to guard. It, it's 
it's exhausting. You just don't really have, I, I think it really has to have an effect on guys in a fourth quarter when you've just been, sometimes getting a rebound can be a reprieve, you know? Every rebound against the Knicks is contested by Mitch, even if you end up getting it. So it's it's got to be exhausting. Yeah, no question. And and, and you're watching these games. You're seeing teams throwing three guys in the box on them. You know, three, four guys try to gang rebound over him, and he's just using his length and athleticism. Some guys just have that knack for the ball, right? But, you know, in watching the Knicks, the guy that was always great at that for me was David Lee. He was just always know where the ball was going to bounce and, and can always get to it. But for Mitch, as you said, and, and I said this erroneously earlier, he, he's second behind Steven Adams in offensive rebounding percentage and third overall in offensive rebounds. But even if he's not scoring, the ability to get the team's second chance points in which they're leading the league, despite the fact that they're near league lows in effective field goal percentage, they're like 25th. <laughs> the second chance opportunities that he provides is major, major for this team. Yeah, you know what else it does? It helps their transition defense, which yeah. has been a problem this year. So they need all the help they can get. And the reason why is because, like you said, teams have to – you can't just have your center box out Mitch and then let a few guys try to leak out and beat the other team down the floor. Yeah, What teams often have to do – because Mitch is going to beat that center. So often what teams will do is they'll throw – one to two, they'll throw like two or three guys at Mitch trying to just get him out of the picture so that somebody can get the rebound and that they can go up. But because they're throwing two or three guys at Mitch, that's two or three guys going in the opposite direction of leaking out in transition right. because they're running back to try to get the rebound. So it just limits the amount of fast break points the Knicks are giving up. It allows them to match up better in transition so that you know, on the secondary break, a team can't take advantage of a mismatch or something like that. Uh, that kind of stuff has a direct correlation to how you're going to defend as well, even though if you look at it in isolation, it actually has nothing to do with defense at all. Uh, so so there's a lot of like Mitch like ripple effects yeah. that that I think really help the team. And if you look at the advanced numbers, by the way, a lot of the advanced numbers are very pro big man. And they mm -hmm. really reward rebounding, and I think too much. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the advanced numbers, and you look at the just the regular old plus minus stuff as well, like they'll tell you Mitch is really, really important, and and that is some a sentiment that I don't disagree with. I think he is really important. Yeah, no, no question. Uh, another guy who I feel like is very important to this team, and since he's been inserted into the starting lineup, I think the the whole defense changed is Quentin Grimes because he's the guy he's guarding the best player. He had the career high against Dallas of 33 points. He's been a floor spacer for the team. The three-point shot is starting to come along. And the thing about him that I, that I love the most, he, he was definitely my player to watch. Year two, Quentin Grimes, and how he was going to impact his team. It's not just the three and D, right? So, because to me, he has a high floor. But what we've been seeing as of late is his ability to attack closeouts, put the ball on the floor, make plays, extend the offense. You see a lot of those wraparound passes that he makes to Mitch in the paint. His ability as a passer has been coming along very strong as of late. And, and you know, when I spoke to him at Summer League, he told me that's what one of the things that he wanted to work on with uh, with, with Penny Hardaway and Coach Perk. What's been your impressions of, of Quentin Grimes? And you also wrote a, a nice piece on, on Grimes uh, just last week or so about his approach to the game. What, what's been your impressions of Grimes? Thanks, man. Appreciate that. I uh, I'm I'm looking to my right right now because I'm looking for a Tibbs quote. You mentioned Grimes attacking closeouts. Uh, I actually asked Tibbs about that after the game on what day was the game? Wednesday. I'm on. It's Wednesday today, so I asked him about it on Monday. Monday against Phoenix. and uh, yes, mm. exactly. Where where Grimes had some really great plays, and it just feels like when teams run him off the three point line. And it might have something to do with the way that teams close out on him too, because they think of him as such a shooter and they don't worry about the drive yet. And once teams face him a third, fourth time, they're going to get used to not getting blown by. It'll be a little more difficult for him. But it really does feel like every single time someone closes out on him and he attacks close out, he blows by his defender. Yeah. Like, like every time. Yeah. And I asked that to Tibbs. Uh, I started it off. I, I, I said to him, you know, if, if, if you lined up every player, in the NBA and just 
had them do a 100 yard dash. Quentin's not going to win the 100 yard dash. And Tibbs interrupted me and said, How do you know that? And I was like, I guess I don't know that. Probably never going to see that, but bear with me. That's fair. Yeah. I don't know that, but I'm guessing he wouldn't win that. Ish Smith would win that. But, but he does seem like he blows by his defender all the time more than any other player in the NBA. Like it feels like he has 100% blow by rate. Uh, and, and I thought Tibbs's answer after he was toying with me was actually pretty interesting. Mm. Um, he, he said, when you look at quickness, it's both mental and physical. So it's anticipating what's coming. Who's closing to me? How are they closing to me? And he, and then he said, uh, he maybe doesn't look like a great athlete, but he is a great athlete. But I think the mind and his quickness to anticipate and to read is what makes him really good. Uh, Mm. I thought it was a really interesting answer because I do think the most interesting thing about Grimes, similar to Obi Toppin, is how quick of a decision maker he is at such a young age. Like he, he never holds on to the ball and doesn't look like he knows what to do. It's the ball comes and it is immediate. Uh, you know, Phoenix has has a saying at point point fives, which is you want to make a decision within half a second. You want to, if you're shooting, you should know within half a second. If you're passing, know within half a second. If you're driving, know within half a section. If you're second, if you have to pull back out and go into a new action, know within half a second. Mm-hmm. And you see offenses that move seamlessly, you know, invoke those principles. Grimes could fit in an offense like that. You know, he very well, that's how he operates. And I think that's kind of what Tibbs is saying there, right? like he knows what he is going to do and he makes the decision quickly and he's really good at it it's it's a great trait to have Mm -hmm. and it's why i think he basically fits into any kind of offense that you need beyond just the fact that he's a shooter who can defend uh it's really encouraging when you see a 22 year old who makes decisions like that yeah and and stephen curry he was he was quoted as as liking it in as a grenade you know, you, you got to make a decision, get rid of it. And, and that's how he likened uh, Steve Kerr's offense. Willie Green gets credited for that with the way New Orleans is running things as well. And, and you're right, man. Just Grimes is quick decision making. It, it's helping everybody in, 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 all over, all across the, the offense. It's It's been a pleasure to watch, especially because he had to start off slow with the foot injury. But seems like he's uh, he, it seems like he's 100 percent healthy the way he's moving out there so definitely good to see and once again we're talking to Fred Katz of the athletic who covers the Knicks now Fred as we record this this episode you know Knicks are currently within that top 10 offensively defensively seventh in net rating so when we look at Tom Thibodeau it's just interesting because for me covering the post game shows and covering the team nightly basis and hearing from the fans from a nightly basis, you still have the, the Tibbs detractors. They got to move on from him. They got to move on. He's not the coach of this team. He doesn't adjust this, that, and the third. But here we are with this team. <laughs> Top 10, offense, defense, seventh in net rating. He made the, the nine-man rotation change at 10 and 5 since then as, at the time of this recording. How do you look at Tibbs right now with this team? They are so weird, man. I wrote... I wrote a story that published just before we started recording uh, about exactly that. They're uh, they're 11th in points per possession right now. They are seventh in points allowed per possession and they're eighth in point differential per possession. That is a really good profile. And they're top, so they're top 11 in offense, top 11 in defense. Mm-hmm. And that sounds like a gerrymandered sort of <laughs> cutoff just because the Knicks are 11th. <laughs> right. But it's it's actually not. Uh, if you look at until last year when the Warriors won, if you look at the last 17 champions, all of them were top 11 in both offense and defense during the regular season. The Warriors were middle of the pack last year in offense, but they're mm-hmm. the exact type of team that's the exception, right? Mm-hmm. Like they – they obviously they had a new gear and they were getting Clay Thompson back, which made a huge difference clearly. Right. And they have Stephen Curry and they have championship DNA and three rings and they had non-switch and they knew it. So mm-hmm. like, you know, obviously they're the exception. 
what's shown over the last 17 years, and by the way, the team 18 years ago that won was was Detroit, which yeah. is thought of as a remarkable exception team because right. they didn't have a good offense, right? Mm-hmm. And before that was the 01 Lakers, Lakers, who famously yeah. didn't play defense in the regular season because they mailed it in and right. they were repeat camps. And so, like, there are reasons we see these exceptions. Mm-hmm. If you're top 11, you're a title. You're 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 in that conversation. And the teams in the top 11 in both offense and defense right now are the Boston Celtics, who have the best record in the NBA, the Brooklyn Nets, who have the second best record in the NBA, mm-hmm. New Orleans Pelicans, who are one game back of first place in the Western Conference. The Cleveland Cavaliers, who have elite scoring guards and top-notch paint protection with Evan Mobley and Jared Allen. Uh, The number one ranked defense, and they have a dude who just dropped 71 points. And by the way, Cleveland could totally make a run to the conference finals. I I don't see why not. And it's those four teams, plus the Knicks. (laughs) They're so <laughs> weird, and yet they're just treading 500. Yeah, And it's like that is a profile that if you look at everything but the record, that is supposed to be a title contending profile. Right Now, the Knicks are on the bottom part of it, right? They're, they're seventh in, in defense, and they're 11th in offense. It's not yeah. like they're, you know, fourth and Top five. seventh or yeah. something. Or, yeah, exactly. They're on the bottom part of it. But even so, like – the argument here is not like the Knicks should be a title contender. It's just that profile says they should be better than 20 and 18. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and and you look at some of the ends of game stuff, and it's like if Luka doesn't get one offensive rebound, if uh, DeMar has one shot that just hits the back Goes of the rim. Yeah, yeah. If Jalen Brunson in that Portland game hits that floater at the buzzer yeah. instead of it rimming out, they're 23 and 15. And then we're like, whoa, the Knicks are vastly overplaying expectations. Yeah. So it's been really weird trying to evaluate that. I I know you asked about Tibbs. Mm-hmm. I, I do think with Tibbs, he's done a much better job than he did last year. Mm-hmm. And there's been, you know, the you know, I think the the offensive scheme stuff kind of is what it is. Mm-hmm. But he's also like, look, I talk about Julius Randle revamping shot selection. Like, so is Tibbs. They have, they have one of the most analytically friendly shot profiles in the NBA, mm-hmm. and I think that's a big reason why they're in the top third of the league in offense in spite of the fact that they don't have much three-point shooting. They take good shots right. as a team as a whole. I think they take the fewest long twos of any team in the NBA, and the guys who take long twos are the ones who should be taking long twos. They're, they're, they're Brunson and, and, and Julius, and that's about it. Uh, they guard hard. They play hard. Uh they have an identity now. I think every player is is aware of his own role. Um, you know, it's it's hard for me to look at guys who are in the rotation currently and say about really any of them, oh, that guy should be playing much better. You know what I yeah, mean? Right, right. So so overall I think I think he's done done an okay job. I mean, I I don't really understand why it has to be all or nothing. With so many of these guys, yeah, like why Evan Fournier, for the most part, either can start or can't play at all, and then it takes a month and a half for him to get back into the rotation, or uh, you know, there are certain certain Tibbs tendencies that I don't I don't quite get, and he doesn't care to explain himself for. Um, but overall, I mean, I think the team's about where it should be, and the profile says they should be a little bit better. So this next month's going to be real interesting. Because they have yeah. a pretty easy schedule for the next three weeks. The deadline's in five weeks. How is that going to? How are they going to handle things if they're seven over five hundred or something? Like it's going to be. That'll be interesting. Yeah, you, you know what it is. I, I think with the fans, especially longtime Knicks fans, we're just so used to things falling apart at some point within regimes, right? Completely falling apart, whether the locker room is exploding or there's politics in, in the front office that leads to somebody getting fired or the coaches lost the locker room. So we're, just, we're, we're always just waiting for that shoe to fall. Like, what is the, the final domino that's going to be the nail in the coffin? I looked at the, 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 the game that they barely won in Philly with no Harden and Embiid and just seems like the team had kind of almost let go of the rope. The game against OKC where they gave up 145 at home and a lot of fans thought, is this going to be it for Tibbs? Is this the death now now you look at it okc uh drops 150 on the celtics with no say gildas alexander so it just seems to be part of the uh, high scoring nba but 
you know, we're always just, just looking for that shoe to fall and we're not looking at this season as a marathon and not a sprint. Because if you look around the league, these other teams going through their peaks and valleys. You know, the Celtics started off red hot. Now they've kind of come back and regressed to the mean a little bit. They're going through their struggles. The Heat have started from the bottom. Now they're coming on, on the rise, coming up. Golden State going through their injuries and, and in the bottom of, of the West. The Lakers and so on. So every team is kind of going through, you know, trying to figure things out, trying to find themselves and, and see who they really are before they make that that final second half push. So I just think that's kind of where that, that PTSD from the fans comes from. But with Tibbs, for me, I just question with the nine-man rotation, yes, it's, it's working now. I think they need some more bench scoring. We'll see what happens when, when Obi comes back. The Hartenstein and Sims thing seems to have worn out its welcome after the first few experiments. And then I just think it's just a little too rigid. Like you said, with the, with the Fournier situation, you know, why is it an all or nothing situation? Because I, I look at a guy like McBride who loves his defensive effort and intensity, but offensively he, he, he gives you nothing to, to me. And so I, I look at Fournier, I look at Reddish, and I'm just like, you know, why is it that the doors are slammed on these guys when you may need to make an in-game adjustment where you may need Fournier's offense as he's provided against the Rockets and the Suns and so and, and San Antonio, or you may need the length of, of a Reddish and, and the athleticism to, to match up against the Siakams of the world. I, I just don't like how the door is just locked on the rotation as it stands right now. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I totally get that. I think that makes sense. Uh, it's, it's a place where it requires a player to be extra much like extra professional you know what i mean yeah where i don't think it's unprofessional to lose confidence when you're so deep in the doghouse i think it can be unprofessional to lose confidence when you're so deep in the doghouse and i think you can get so deep in the doghouse by being unprofessional but i don't think okay a guy lost confidence when he got benched and couldn't play no matter what and thus he's not a professional i don't think that's the case I think from everything that I've seen and everything that I've heard, it seems like Fournier has just, he's at that level. Mm. He's been kind of a pro's pro the whole time. Uh, and he's still working out. You know, you watch him when he was out of the rotation for a month and a half, I'd watch his, one of the things I like to do is I like to watch guys pregame routines. Mm -hmm. That's something that I learned from scouts where scouts will get there really, other team scouts will get there really, really early and they'll watch guys pregame routines mm -hmm. because you you can see stuff in a pregame routine. You don't necessarily see in a game. Uh, you see what they what they like to work on, and you can also see how hard they go through their 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 stuff. Mm -hmm. And Fournier, if you watch his pregame routine, like he's going at game speed, even when he knows he is not. Now he's playing, but even when he knew that he wasn't playing, like he's going at game speed. Like he was mm -hmm. treating that pregame routine like his like his game, and. I promise you, you know who pays attention to that stuff? Tom Tibbs. 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 I mm. absolutely guarantee you mm. that he pays attention to all of that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, and I think that's why, you know, every once in a while you watch a Cam Reddish routine. He's kind of pregame and he's kind of going through the motions. At you know, times. We, we've like, had fans thing. call in and say the same, man. They didn't, they weren't so uh, complimentary of Cam's pregame energy, pregame routine. Yeah. And, and so I think all that stuff starts to add up, mm. you know, it starts to add up. And, and I agree that I don't think you need to live on such extremes. I think there's nuance to everything. But I don't think it's a coincidence that the one guy who we've seen never get out of the doghouse is Reddish. Mm. I, I just I just don't think that that's a coincidence. Uh, um, you know, Fournier is playing again, and I wouldn't be surprised if he if he's stuck. Where it's going to be really interesting when Obi comes back. Yeah. It sounds like he's getting a little closer. Mm. Uh, I, I It's going to be really interesting to see if Fournier – keeps playing because uh, because he gives them some shooting that they they could use i mean part of the reason that he got benched was because he just wasn't playing as well as yeah. he was last year if they get the version of evan fournier from last season it's a different kind of conversation right. than if they get the one who was shooting 34 percent to start this one so uh you know i'm with you 
the the extremes are weird, but also like he, Tibbs is consistent in what he's looking for. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like he is. He there is no there should be no confusion as to what Tibbs is looking for in those sorts of you know he 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 wants a guy like Miles McBride. Yeah, doesn't care if Miles McBride is going to miss every shot. He is going to go out there, and you know that his energy is going to be insane. Yeah, and his defense is going to be ridiculous, and that absolutely no one is going to play harder than him or work harder than him. Like you just, he, he knows that, and he's not the only coach who's like that, but he is definitely a extreme version of that. And by the way, it's not an all. I'm I'm just rambling now, mm-hmm. but he's it's not all a bad thing. By the way, like I think it's pretty good that all of the Knicks young guys are really try hard defensive yeah. minded uh guys who like care about the gritty work. I think that's a pretty damn good culture to have. So there's a weird side to it, which you get when guys are just on the bench not being able to come out. And then there's a side to it where you're like, oh well that's pretty encouraging. Yeah. When you have, you know, say McBride and and quickly and and uh and uh and Grimes on the floor together. And that's an undersized backcourt and they're all 23 or younger. And you would think that it shouldn't be really, really good defensively because they have a size disadvantage and the age disadvantage. Yeah, they're getting after it. And they're freaking passes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, that, you know, that that comes from that same part of the culture. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, no question about it. And we're talking to Fred Katz, who covers the Knicks for The Athletic. Uh, final question for you, Fred, as as we enter this midway point. Trade deadline is coming up in February. And this team, I would have to assume that Leon wants to be buyers, although we've heard that Fournier's name is on this uh, uh, trading block, Cam Reddish. We've heard Quickly's name be on the trading block. Where do you see them going here uh, at, at the trade deadline? I'm not sure. Part of the reason I wrote that story today about kind of their, their profile and where they rank on offense and defense versus their record is because it's going to, you know, we're like five weeks away from the deadline and it's going to be really interesting to see how they evaluate themselves. Like, do they think that they're a 500 team or do they think, you know what, this says that we're better because that could affect how they go about the deadline. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think they're going to go out there and trade like two first round picks for a guy in an expiring contract. They've Mm -hmm. shown that they, they're not into impulse buys mm-hmm. and they're not into future compromising moves. They, their grand plan is still to save up these draft picks for, for a star. And I think that's what we're going to end up seeing, you know, the, a similar sort of attempt that, that they had on Donovan Mitchell, but on somebody else. And, uh, and, and so I don't think they're going to end up doing some sort of rental with their draft picks. Mm-hmm. Uh, that being said, they are always very aggressive on the phones. Like they really are uh, really curious to see what happens with quickly. Yeah. They played so well, uh, you know, since they started to, to listen to offers for him and, and make phone calls about him. And he has been such a huge part of that, whether he's shooting the ball well or not. Right. And I just, I wonder how that affects their process in those conversations or if they are less willing to have those conversations now and in February than they were in, November when the team was kind of floundering a little bit. Uh, so, so, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not totally sure. I, I think they could definitely use another shooter. Yeah. I think you could argue uh, they could use like a, a wing who can shoot, but you know, who couldn't like, right. if you could throw a, a guy who could defend and shoot and say the McBride role. Yeah. I think that would be a really helpful upgrade for them. Mm-hmm. Maybe a guy with a little bit more size. And then you have them next to RJ and you've got some size on the wing in your bench units. Yeah. But there's a reason that guys who can shoot and defend are hard to find. Right. Right. Yeah. That, that's exactly Everybody right. Everybody needs man. them. Yeah. It, it's going to be interesting to see because like with the quickly thing, it's uh, what are they looking for in the now, but also how are they positioning themselves in the future? Because you're going to have to pay quickly. You're going to have to pay Obi. A Quentin Grimes decision will need to be made in a few years. And so, with all these draft picks that they have on the horizon and then what they have now in their young core, it's just going to be interesting to see, Do is everybody going to stick around? You know, I don't see it, but then it's like, 
do you trade it quickly for a future pick and punt for the future? That's a hard sell for the fans, man, based on how he's helping his team right now. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it definitely is a hard sell. I, I think it, I don't think they were ever just like giving away quickly, especially after the way last summer went Mm -hmm. where their protected picks turned out not to be some sort of, uh, their, their protected picks weren't looked at as gold, you know? Yeah. Like the Donovan Mitchell trade was decided by unprotected picks, you know? Cleveland was willing to give up three unprotected first rounders, mm. and the Knicks were not. And that's what decided the Donovan Mitchell deal. Uh, so so I don't think they were necessarily – like like they, they weren't going to trade quickly for just like a future top 20 protected yeah. first rounder. I don't think that was going to be the case. It wasn't going to be like the pick they gave up for Cam Reddish. Or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it, if they were going to do it, it was going to be for a good first round pick. Now, I don't know how they necessarily define good. I don't know what their limits were, but I'm with you. If they just remove quickly from the roster, I think it's a hard sell because they're, they're also not trying to be worse. That's the right. thing. They, they, they don't want to drop from seven to 10. They don't want to drop into the line lottery like they want to make the playoffs they mm-hmm. want to be competitive part of their plan is to to make themselves into a desirable, desirable. location so a star mm-hmm. says i want to go there and a star isn't going to say that about a 13 seed so mm-hmm. they don't want to get worse and no matter what you think of emmanuel quickly as a player whether you think that you know he dribbles too much and doesn't shoot a high enough percentage to be a starter or you think he's a, a point guard or you think he's a, an off guard or whatever no matter what you think of his actual role like he's a good basketball player who helps you win basketball yeah. games. Uh, so, so giving him away for something that that might not help as much, I don't think was was ever necessarily the plan. I think it was to try to get something of actual value back. And maybe if you can trade quickly for 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 something that can really help you, uh, then then maybe that's something they'll still consider. But. Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's going to be really interesting because because there aren't a ton of quickly deals that I can just imagine. Yeah, that that are going to fit what they're trying to do after how important he's he's proven to be this year. Yeah, no question. Especially you know if you're looking at on the flip side of the table, a team that would ultimately have to look to pay him once his once his rookie deal is up. So it, it, I think it is a tricky trade. Uh, there are some names I like out there. I don't know how much a Bogdanovich will, will cost from from Detroit. Uh, he was a guy that Detroit got on the cheap, but he, he could be in demand right now. We'll see if the Lakers go after him. I like Clarkson as well from Utah, man, because I, I think the Knicks could use some more consistent scoring punch. I don't know if that would come in at an expense of a quickly, but I, I do like a Clarkson, even though I don't see the Knicks and the Jazz doing coming back to the table on any deals anytime that might be soon. Tough. Man. That might be tough. That that might be that tough. That might be man. tough. Yeah, I mean, the thing with, with quickly, too, is like, He's their he's their best positional defender on the perimeter. He's mm-hmm. such a good, good help defender now. Uh, he's such a we talk about quick decision makers. That's mm-hmm. another one. Mm-hmm. He's such a quick decision maker on defense, and he tries really freaking hard. But it's not just because he plays hard. Like he is a ridiculously smart defender, and he's he's good on the ball too. But off the ball, he's really good, mm-hmm. uh, and, and that is important especially with the Tom Thibodeau defense, which puts mm. such a heavy burden on the weak side defender when the mm. ball hits the paint. Cause that guy has to dig into the lane and then scurry back out to the corner yeah. in order to close out when the ball gets kicked back out. You need guys who play really, really hard who are really, really well conditioned. So they don't get tired because mm. that's a lot of running and a lot of agility right. who are really quick like he is and who are just smart enough to know where they're supposed to be and when they're supposed to be there. Mm. And, and quickly checks all of those boxes as a defender there. I think it's a big reason why their defense has been as good as it has for the last, you know, however many games it's been where they're top 10 in the league in defense. I I, I think, I just think he's he's kind of hard to replace because he's got such a weird, weird profile of things that he is good at now. He's almost flipped himself into the reverse of what he was when he was a rookie. Right. When we were like, oh, but if he's not yeah. scoring, he's not giving you much. Right. Now it's and now it's like, oh, if only he could score, he'd give you everything. You know? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's very weird. 
Yeah, weird indeed, man. So time will tell. Uh, but but Fred, I, I really enjoy the, this conversation, man. I appreciate you for checking in with us at the midseason report. Just who these Knicks are. We'll, we'll see what happens, man, as the season progresses. But Fred, uh, once again, great job. Great job with what you're doing at The Athletic covering this team. And uh, let's catch up down the road, man. Thanks again for joining us. Yeah, so happy to be on. You do a great job here. So thank you for having me. All right. Thanks again.